Today, we will dive into a sometimes forgotten and controversial aviation accident which took place at the peak of night just off the Norfolk Island coastline. This video will delve through the preparation before the flight and the action the crew took that fateful night through a simulation based on data and findings from subsequent reports. By retracing the steps taken that fateful night, we will be able to uncover those cracks both within pilot training as well as the regulator that was meant to protect these pilots around Australia in one of Australia's most controversial and industry revolutionary accidents. Today's flight took place at Falelo International Airport, Apia, Samoa's capital city. The current time is 5am on the 18th of November 2009. The aircraft operating is a West Twin 1124A, built in 1983 in Israel, operating in the US before being leased to Pelair in 1989. The aircraft had accumulated a total of 12,000 cycles prior to tonight's flight. Having previously been used for business travel, Pelair had modified the aircraft that was wet leased to care flight in order to conduct air ambulance services. Today, the crew will be transporting a patient to Melbourne with a stopover at Norfolk Island to refuel. The estimated flight time to Norfolk Island is scheduled to be three hours and 30 minutes and a cruising altitude at 36,000 feet. Company procedures did not require the first officer to participate in any flight planning and only be debriefed by the pilot in command. Prior, the pilots had received a TAF for Norfolk Island which was valid from 0600 to 2400 hours and read winds from 260 at 8 knots, visibility at least 10 kilometers and scattered clouds at 2000 feet. Unbeknown to the crew, these parameters would not stand when they descended into Norfolk Island. The flight crew consisted of Captain Dominic James, of whom had accumulated 4000 flight hours with 1000 on this aircraft. The female first officer had a total of 2000 flight hours with 700 on this West Wind aircraft. The passenger cabin included a doctor, flight nurse, patient and family relative, taking the total persons on board to six. At 5.20am, November Golf Alpha is given takeoff clearance bound for Norfolk Island. The takeoff procedure is standard and November Golf Alpha climbs to its cruising altitude of 36,000 feet. As the flight crew continued towards Norfolk Island, without being aware of the changing weather conditions that have taken place. In the Pelé cockpit, the crew complete their approach briefing in which they plan to execute a non-precision VOR approach into runway 29. The aircraft descends through the early morning clouds and rain. The closer the crew get towards the minimum descent altitude, the visibility continues to remain constant and not the 10 kilometres as per the TAF. Norfolk Radio, this is Victor Hotel November Golf Alpha, are you copy? Victor Hotel November Golf Alpha, good evening to you, sir, go ahead. We do have a rain cell that's hitting the runway at this time, the airport. The visibility has dropped down to only about 4,000 as we speak, but I think it's all because of this um, rainstorm we've got going through here now. Uh, can I Keep you informed of the cloud bus as we go along and uh, have you got a multiple for this evening? Uh, negative, we don't. The flight crew decided at 700 feet above ground level, having no visual sight of the runway, execute a go around procedure. The crew then again set up for another VOR approach into runway 29. This time again, the crew had no visual contact with the runway. It is at this point the crew realised they have insufficient fuel to divert, hence must land at Norfolk. Desperate, the crew switched the VOR approach into runway 11, but again, this is unsuccessful. Finally, the Pell Air flight makes a final VOR approach for runway 29, which for the fourth time is unsuccessful. Both captain and first officer agree another approach could not be executed with the fuel on board, hence prepare the aircraft for a ditching 
heading 4.6 kilometres south of Norfolk Island, setting flaps to full. Pull up. Uh, Norfolk, we're going to have to ditch, we've got no fuel. Well, then we've got a couple of issues. Pull up. Uh, Norfolk, we're going to have to ditch, we've got no fuel. The aircraft impacts the ocean at an airspeed of 100 knots, with the captain flying based on the pitch and radio altimeter in the early morning landing. As the aircraft impacts with the ocean, it shears in half, with all on board being projected out of the aircraft. The doctor and flight nurse supported both the first officer and patient that had minor injuries. As the passenger and crew swam towards the land, the captain remembered he had a high-powered green torch in his pocket and began shining it towards the island. Volunteer firefighter Scott Greenwood witnessed this signal and alerted rescue authorities. Well, I was on my way home last night from the fire station and I came out here to see if I could see anything out to sea and turned the car lights off and sure enough there was a faint greenish light out to about four kilometres out to sea and I rang up the emergency services and told them that what I'd seen and they relayed it onto the people in the boat and they changed their course out to this direction. After 90 minutes in the water, the rescue services had located the crash survivors and taken them to a local hospital for medical treatment. It was found that both the doctor and flight nurse had permanent spine injuries, while the first officer had a chest injury from impacting the control column. We now move on to the ATSB and CASA investigation, which took place soon after the accident. After the first port of call after interviews with the crew and witnesses, the investigator's first decision made was to not retrieve both the cockpit voice recorder and flight data recorders from the wreckage. Instead, they decided to take high quality dive images of the wreckage. The aircraft had separated into two sections, the forward fuselage separating the rest from the aircraft just aft of the rear cabin pressure bulkhead. The two sections remain connected by the underfloor cables for the control surfaces and electrical wiring. The separation of the two sections was likely the consequence of damage sustained during the ditching and the subsequent action of waves and other forces acting on the weakened fuselage structure. The model adopted by the investigators was a widely used reason model of accident causation. The reason model has become an industry standard and includes a broad examination of potential organisational deficiencies holding that explanations for accidents which focus on individual performance alone are inadequate. According to the model, defences against accidents act as a series of barriers, often illustrated by consecutive slices of a Swiss cheese. Each hole in each slice and holes are of varying sizes and may change over time, represent a weakness in part of the overall system. The system fails when holes, that is, weaknesses momentarily align, allowing for an accident to occur. The ATSB reason model of accident causation consists of five levels of safety factors. These are occurrence events, individual actions, local conditions, risk controls, that is CASA, the regulatory oversight, and organisational influences, which is the operator Pell Air. The ATSB report found that individual action, that is, not factors to do with the operator or the regulator caused the accident. The report identified three contributing safety factors. All three were concerned with individual action. The pilot in command did not plan the flight in accordance with existing regulatory and operator requirements, precluding a full understanding and management of the potential hazards affecting the flight. The flight crew did not source the most recent Norfolk Island airport forecast or seek the most relevant stage of flight to determine whether to continue the flight to the island or to divert to another destination. Finally, the flight crew's delayed awareness of the deteriorating weather conditions at Norfolk Island combined with incomplete flight planning to influence the decision to continue to the island, rather than divert to a suitable alternate. If we cast our minds back to the reason model, the initial investigation did not attempt to analyse the contextual component of the model risk controls and organisational influences. This conclusion drew widespread criticisms from aviation experts such as Mr McQuinn, an aviation safety consultant, who stated that given the principal function of an investigation report is to reduce future risk by exposing how an accident was able to occur, by explaining the context of this particular accident, three separate defences should have been in place to prevent or reduce the likelihood, including the flight crew, the operator Pell Air, and the regulatory environment, CASA. 
More pressure was piled onto this report after ABC's hit journalism current affair documentary show aired a segment exposing cracks within the ATSB's final report into the Pell Air crash, alleging both the ATSB and CASA of misconduct during the investigation process. This large volume of public criticism prompted a Senate inquiry to take place in 2012. Here are two regulatory issues, one to do with the categorisation of aeromedical flights, and that should have been upgraded to charter so there was more protection granted. That didn't occur. And one, that we should be more prescriptive about fuel requirements for remote islands. Now, I understand Pelle has actually implemented that post your special audit, uh, and I understand CASA has undertaken again to look at that issue both of which point to the fact that here is a regulatory issue that if implemented 10 years ago, either of those, this accident probably wouldn't have happened. Well, I, I, don't, I don't... That's the first I've heard of that recommendation, Senator, myself personally, so I don't connect the two. CASA was undertaking a review in relation to fuel requirements for flights to remote, remote islands. This is over 12 years ago. Yes, Surely it's been resolved. Must, well, it must be. Can't, Please don't tell me that there's, there's still an ongoing review of fuel requirements for remote islands 12 years after it was raised, nearly 13 years, rather, after it was raised. Senator, I, I appreciate what you've raised there is that people should be very prudent when they're flight planning to Norfolk Island. No, I no, agree no, with no, 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 Mr McCormick, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mr McCormick. There was a role for CASA to take. The Civil Aviation Safety Authority has commenced a project to review the fuel requirements for flights to remote islands. Can anyone at this table please tell me what the review involved. When was that review concluded? Senator, Senator, sorry, we weren't involved. We weren't involved in this. We weren't in these positions in the year 2000. I don't know what's happened to that report. I will find it out on notice. Very serious matters were raised in that report. And it's, um, is, it, is it fair to assume that, in fact, CASA has not, has not after t almost 13 years, reviewed the fuel requirements to flights from remote, remote islands? The ATSB representatives during the inquiry repeatedly stated the legal jargon mea culpa, meaning they are aware and acknowledge the deficiencies within the organisational process for aircraft accident investigations. I think there's much wrong with investigating what led to it in great detail. Chair, yeah. hmm. I, I've, since you've started, there's been mea culpa after mea culpa after mea culpa in this thing, and you, perhaps you know now you're hearing evidence for the first time is what is supposed to be a forensic investigation into an investigation. I, it, I've heard that this report uh, would be a joke in the international standing. If other reviewers were to, to, to have uh, reviewed this, I think uh, uh, the evidence that Senator Xenophon and Fawcett are drawing out would suggest that. Um, we haven't even got to the black box yet. Right. So, are you proud of this report? Uh, I certainly wouldn't hold this report as a benchmark, Senator. Uh, the, I'm still satisfied that the key elements... Three we, years in the making, mea culpa after mea culpa, are you proud of this report? I'm not proud of this report, no, Senator. No. Okay. Following a Senate inquiry, a report was released in 2013 recommending that the report conducted by the ATSB be withdrawn and redone. Their key points for this reinvestigation was prompted by the Senate committee determining that the ATSB's decision to not retrieve the flight recorders was incongruous with its responsibility under the International Civil Aviation Organization, ACAO. Evidence of collusion between the agencies, that CASA deliberately withheld the Chamber's report from the ATSB, and finally, heads of both ATSB and CASA agencies gave testimonies that weren't credible. The Senate inquiry concluded by passing evidence to the Australian Federal Police, pending the possibility of charges being laid against individuals from CASA who were involved in breaching the Transport Safety Investigation Act of 2003. The second investigation into the Pell Air ditching led by the Transportation Safety Board of Canada began to point out the flaws and deficiencies within the first investigation by the ATSB. This included that the ATSB's current methodologies and processes met recommended practices as described in the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, Annex 13. 
but failed to meet their own standards in the Norfolk Island ditching incident. After this review process by the CTSB, the ATSB could begin their reinvestigation. Late December 2014 was the start date for the second ATSB investigation into the Pellard ditching. This time, the investigation methodologies and processes had clearly been laid out, so any deviation in the investigation could be mitigated. Unlike the first investigation where the CVR and FDR were not retrieved by reason of surviving crew, the FDR and CVR were located one year on in November 2015. Both contained valid and analyzable data. In November 2017, the ATSB finally published a 531-page report on the Pale Air Westwind ditching, which took place off the Norfolk Island coast. Having this time correctly explored all avenues within the reason model, including occurrence events, individual actions, local conditions, risk controls, and organizational influences, investigators were able to identify multiple contributing safety factors which intertwined itself in the outcome of the accident. Focusing on individual actions, the report, as per the initial report, reinforced the notion that the captain executed inadequate fuel planning. If the aircraft had the maximum amount, a diversion would have been possible. The crew also failed to obtain aerodrome weather forecasts in flight planning, as well as not obtaining a current aerodrome forecast and notums for potential alternate aerodrome during the flight. And finally, failing to calculate an adequate point of no return PNR, which is the calculated point in which the flight cannot divert to an airfield. In terms of local conditions, the ATSB shone light on the ATC at Nardi and Auckland, failing to inform the pilot of the deteriorating weather conditions. They recommended that in due course that the ATC be proactive in providing weather updates during deteriorating weather conditions, even if a pilot does not request a weather update. Investigators also found the operator Pelair culpable of negligence with regards to the standard operating procedures for this west wind aircraft. Generally, Pelair uses a conservative approach to fuel planning and no restrictions on the amount of fuel that pilots uploaded. The ATSB's recommendations included SOPs requiring the first officer to cross-check the captain's flight planning, explicit fuel planning to remote or isolated aerodromes, formal guidance material about how to calculate a point of no return PNR, for an off-track alternate aerodrome, formal guidance material regarding what types of weather information to obtain during a flight and when to obtain that information, finally, increased pilot training and flight planning for remote aerodrome operations. Finally, the report highlighted the deficiencies of the regulator CASA in its role in the accident. This included no explicit Australian regulatory requirements for fuel planning to flights of isolated aerodromes. Furthermore, air ambulance flights transporting passengers were classified as aerial work rather than charter. Consequently, they were subject to a lower level of regulatory requirements than other passenger operations, including terms of requirements for fuel planning of flights to remote islands. A total of 42 recommendations were made by the ATSB to reduce further risk across all four areas of pilot training, ATC, weather service providers, the operator Pelair, and the regulator CASA. Now, we arrive after a journey through one of Australia's most controversial and industry revolutionary accidents. By linking the chains together of each factor that contributed towards the Norfolk Island ditching, we can hopefully reflect and move forward into the future with improved aviation safety. In a multi-crew environment, we witnessed deficient cockpit resource management CRM procedures in flight planning for remote aerodrome operations. However, as we know, this inadequacy was influenced by the SOPs set by the operator and the regulator for civil aviation in Australia. Improved pilot training and stricter operator SOPs and regulator guidelines for flight planning to remote aerodromes was the key finding from the Pale Air Norfolk Island ditching. We also discovered the potential flaws that occur in the investigation process for aviation accidents and one that could potentially influence both past and present accidents all around the world. Are investigators purely blaming the pilots rather than looking at all the causes as per the Swiss cheese model? It is now up to investigators to ensure that the model used for analysis to reduce safety risks is followed in improving the safety for all pilots moving forward from this accident.